A very good afternoon to all the attendees and to uh, the panelists and to our speaker, Professor Pascal Fong, uh, in this special public lecture, which is being organized uh, by the National Academy of Sciences India Delhi Chapter and MHRD Institution Innovation Council, Dindyal Upadhyay College, under the aegis of DBT Star College program. Well, this special public lecture uh, is being organized in conjunction with the online summer school on advances in signal processing and machine learning. And today we have uh, with us uh, Pascal Fung, who will be delivering her talk on empathetic conversational artificial intelligence. As a customary, I'll introduce Professor Pascal Fung. Uh, she received her PhD in computer science from Columbia University in 1997 and worked and studied at AT&T Bell Labs 1993 to 1997, BBN Systems and Technologies 1992, Lindsay Siener Strauss in 1991, Department of Information Science, Kyoto University, Japan 1989 to 1991, and at Ecole in France in 1988. She's a professor at the Department of Electronic and Computer Engineering and Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. As an uh, elected fellow of IEEE and the director of HQST Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, an interdisciplinary research center on top of all four schools at HQST. She co-founded the Human Language Technology Center and is also an affiliated faculty with the Robotics Institute and the Big Data Institute at HQST. She's an expert on the Global Future Council, a think tank for the World Economic Forum, and represents HKST on partnership on AI to benefit people and society, and is also on the advisory board of building agile governance for artificial intelligence and robotics. Today, her research interest lies in building intelligent systems that can understand and empathize with humans. To achieve this goal, her specific areas of research are using statistical modeling and deep learning for natural language processing, spoken language systems, emotion and sentiment recognition, and other areas of AI. She's an editor for Computer Speech and Language and is the president and board member of the ACL Special Interest Group on Linguistic Data and Corpus-Based Approaches in NLP. She has been a panelist and reviewer for the US National Science Foundation, the French National Science Foundation, and the Hong Kong Research Grants Council. Uh, with these words, I request uh, Professor Fung to kindly share her screen. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Okay. Namaste, everybody. So I'm very honored to be inv invited, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about one of my uh, um, uh, key interests in research today, which is the uh, empathetic conversational AI. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, so this is a picture of a person talking to a machine. Um, it's a kind of exaggeration, but I find it very beautiful. So I give you a little bit of my personal history of conversational um, uh, systems. Uh, I, uh, so as um, you kindly introduced, I worked on uh, actually uh, the first DAPA project, US Def Department of Defense funded DAPA project called the Communicator Project on Dialogue Systems in the 1990s. Uh, uh, when I came to HKUST in 97 and 98, we built the first voice browser in languages. And early 2000s, we built a multi-platform voice search, and it's the first uh, voice search engine in Chinese, um, uh, in the Chinese language. And uh, from there on, 2010, we, had, we, we built the first smartphone assistant using voice, so it's kind of like Siri. In the same time as Siri came out with the English one, we came out with the Chinese one for the App Store in China. Uh, and then there are other uh, systems. I will show you later a system uh, called uh, Moobox. It's an empathetic smart speaker, and we built it again at the same time as Amazon Echo. Uh, we came out, actually, we, we came out before they did. Um, and then um, from there on, there are other systems. Uh, Again, I will show you something called Nora, the virtual therapist. In any case, uh, more recently, we have focused more on end-to-end -end neuro uh, uh, em empathetic chatbot. So I will explain in this talk what, what, what do I mean by end-to-end -end neuro chatbot, All right? Um, so conversation systems are in general divided into two kinds. 
We call them the chit chat bots and the task oriented systems. So chit chat bots are a system that you talk, you converse with, with no specific goal, just have a fun conversation. And the objective is to uh, make the user engaged and the more turns, a turn is basically a, 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 a question response between user and the system. And the more turns, and then the, the system's supposed to be better. And uh, there are, uh, today we are using all kinds of generational models on deep learning generational models. Now, task oriented uh, dialogue systems have been around since uh, for 30 years, actually. So, since the first DAPA communicator project, those are the systems such as the uh, uh, part of Siri, for example, it helps the user to achieve a specific task or specific goal. It, it focuses on understand user intent, tracking the states and generating next actions. And in this case, though, the system is supposed to be performing better if it uses less turns. If Siri can help you reach your um, goal faster, then its performance is better. And these kind of systems have been using a combination of rules, uh, knowledge-based systems and statistical components. So most of today's com um, commercial systems tend to be rule-based or template-based, and uh, and it's moving towards more and uh, with some components with uh, statistical models. But the, uh, today I will introduce to you what we do with the end-to-end -end neural models. So this is the uh, standard architecture of a modularized conversational system. Uh, when I say this architecture, actually this is the same architecture from 30 years ago to today. So basically, uh, Amazon um, Alexa, Siri, Apple Siri, uh, Microsoft Cortana, these are the latest systems, commercial systems. Um, they are basically descendants of the same DAPA communicator system 30 years ago. And the modules are similar. So you start with a speech recognition that decodes the user voice into the sentence. And then there's a spoken language understanding component. And then you have this dialogue management component that tracks the dialogue state and it access the external knowledge base and decides what, what the response should be by a natural language generation module. And then there's a TTS module that translates the um, uh, machine response into voice if necessary. So this is a standard uh, modularized system that has been around for a long time. And in each of these components, uh, in each of these components, you will have these uh, subtasks. So for spoken language understanding, uh, the system is supposed to identify the domain, the intent of the user, and try to find the semantic slots. Uh, and the dialogue state tracking, there are other subtasks. Um, dialogue management has other subtasks, such as query the knowledge base and uh, the dialogue policy. And then you have subtasks for uh, natural language generation to map actions and states into natural language. So this kind of subtasks are done by various systems in various approaches. They can be rule-based, template-based, and uh, designed by humans, actually. So some many of the Siri responses are designed by humans. Um, other systems will actually try to learn, uh, such as a dialogue policy or the genera generated response statistically. Now, today, the breakthrough is that we have replaced the entire <laughs> task oriented dialogue system by deep learning modules. So this is what we call end to end. So we don't have those sub modules anymore. We have a big deep learning uh, architecture that learns the answer response end to end. And it also learns to access external knowledge base. Why do we want to do that? Because end to end neural. So you, you can imagine if you want to do all these subtasks, they each have to be trained by a different set of training data where, that we need to collect and we need humans to annotate before the machine can learn. Whereas if we can use a end-to-end -end, uh, module, the uh, model, then we can just uh, collect human to human conversation um, and directly allow the module uh, models to learn. There's no need for human annotation, no need to label it uh, into different dialogue states and so on. So it requires less human effort, which makes data set collection easier. And there's no dependency between different modules. It learns all the hidden dialogue states automatically. 
uh, and then it can generalize better. Of course, the uh, uh, the the uh, prerequisite for these models, of course, is that we need to have um, access to large amount, huge amount of human to human or human to system dialogue uh, examples, which was not possible before. Now it is possible. So you have all these um, public systems that are answering uh, user queries every day, and then you can collect the uh, this data. And if you don't have them, there are also many publicly available uh, data sets that you can use to 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 um, train your system. And yet, other ways uh, is to basically you design a modular system and then use that system as a simulator to converse with users. And then you you um, you you collect data that way, and then you train your deep learning models. So there are different ways. But the trend is towards end-to-end -to -end neural conversation systems. Of course, to build such a system, there are many, many challenges. How can you allow the model to, ex, um, to um, access external knowledge base? How can the model learn to have a memory of uh, what has been uh, talked about earlier? Uh, so very at the big, you know, in the early uh, deep learning model, we show um, that uh, chatbots will come up with answers that are a little bit uh, messy in the sense that it will not remember what it has said before, so it will have inconsistent answers. And also, uh, uh, only until 2018, uh, people start to, uh, in our group actually propose them, uh, a way to allow these models to uh, access external knowledge base. What's an external knowledge base? Oh, for example, the price and the location of restaurants, you know, um, the, the price and location of, um, uh, your ticket booking uh, systems. So you need to have a knowledge base externally, but these models have to learn that as well. So it knows how to complete a task. It's not just a chat chatbot. Okay, so this is um, the ch various challenges of end-to-end -end neural conversational systems. Today, I actually want to emphasize on the particular aspect of uh, conversational AI. Uh, which namely how to allow these systems learn to empathize with the users. You may be asking why does the system, why do, why do conversational systems need to empathize with users? So first of all, let's define empathy. Empathy basically is the capacity to recognize and share another person's feelings. The more important reason, as I uh, 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 describe in my article on uh, in, in Scientific American, in 2015, natural language understanding, human to human communications are not based on literal meaning of the words spoken or words uh, uh, only. We use emotion as a as, as, uh, as third or the fourth channel to convey the meaning, right? Uh, I don't have time to go through uh, the experiments, but it has been shown that users uh, or humans understand each other better when we can see each other's emotions, listen to the tone of voice, and uh, we use that to convey our, our meaning better. For example, if I say, how are you? How are you? How are you? Right? So all these actually different things, even though I have the same words. And uh, there are other practical reasons why machines need to be emotionally intelligent. Uh, robots and virtual agents, these are uh, conversational systems that are, uh, that they are today deployed uh, in some domains. They can actually, machines can outperform humans in automatic recognition of user emotion and personality. So in applications such as HR or customer service virtual agent, they need to understand user emotions. It can also adapt functionality based on user's current mood. For example, a personal DJ, like the smart speakers that's recommending music to you, if the smart speaker can detect your emotion and the mood and the ambience of the room, it can play the appropriate music. Uh, more importantly, a conversational system uh, needs to engage the user, right, in order to reach, uh, to, to have a better task completion outcome, it needs to engage the user. So if the system can understand the user better, can empathize with the user, can um, personalize the, um, 
can provide personalized service to the user, then the users, uh, user will be more engaged. And this increased engagement helps uh, tasks such as childcare, virtual agent, virtual therapist, and so on and so forth. So, here uh, I'm showing you uh, one of our work published in Conversational AI uh, Workshop in ACL 2019 called Getting to Know You. Um, this is a, a, a method, um, end to end neuro, um, neuro conversational AI system that learns about user attributes by talking to the user. So what does that mean? So if I talk to you, if I just meet you, I just met you and we say, hey, how are you, how are you? And we start to introduce each other. Sometimes we don't, uh, we introduce ourselves and say, yeah, I have, you know, uh, I have, you know, dogs, I love dogs. Oh, you, are, you know, what's your hobby and so on. So we get to know each other through our conversations. In this case, we want the, uh, the system to, uh, to get to know the user better. So here you have this human to human conversational uh, conversation examples. Hi, hello, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Great, thanks. My children and I were just about to watch Game of Thrones. This gives me the information that person two has children, right? And then likes uh, Game of Thrones. And then you go on to see, you know, converse, oh, how old are your children? I have four that range in age from 10 to 21. You? So this kind of conversation allow the, the humans to get to know each other. So we also want the system to know humans um, attributes this way. So what do we do? <coughs> we try to extract from the utterances the attributes. For example, here, if the user said, I'm originally from California, but now I live in Florida for long, then you, uh, you basically, <clears throat> the system will extract the attribute of, I live in Florida. Living is the predicate and the subject and object. Who living, where? I live in Florida. Uh, I no longer work at banks, but for exercise, I walk often. So you extract all these attributes of the user through conversation. So here is uh, uh, our architecture of how to do this. We basically use a dialogue history encoder, right? And we use a predicate classifier too. So for each conversation or each, uh, each utterance, the predicate classifier looks for a predicate such as have vehicle, like go to, has children, all these predicates. Predicates are basically the verbs. And then from there, uh, the entity generator will decode the subject and the object. All right. And then um, uh, it obtains this kind of triplet of predicate, subject, object for the system. So the system will remember the user attributes and you use this information, hopefully. Uh, hopefully, using this user attribute to give more personalized dialogue. And, uh, and this is, uh, we have uh, shown initial positive results by personalizing a system this way. Secondly, we would also like to uh, uh, identify user emotions through the dialogue. So, Semival 2019 shared tasks were ranked fourth out of 160 team in the official final rank. And uh, we benchmark several feature-based classifiers using pre-trained word and emotion embeddings. So not just word embeddings, but also emotion embeddings. And uh, so this is how we do it. Uh, instead of uh, trying to find the emotion, identify the emotion from the dialogue from a uh, flat model, we have this hierarchical model where um, we use a share encoder for all emotions and use as a sentence level um, feature to the emotion classifier. All right, so this way, uh, different emotions share some features and uh, we can decode better. So this is our result, and, uh, uh, which is very, very good and very promising. We also uh, published some work on psychological stress detection from spoken language. So here is to detect um, a user stress. And again, I will show in the demo why we want to do that. So um, if you are uh, building a virtual therapist, you will want to know whether a user is not just happy or angry, but whether the user is stressed or not. So this is a purposely a purpose built classifier that detects user stress. All right, um, again, um, 
uh, we use distance supervision to improve the model's robustness. All this kind of emotion recognition systems suffer from lack of annotated data. You can imagine that data that's annotated uh, by humans with emotion labels are very expensive and they are very, very hard to, to, to build because um, humans have a hard time agreeing on what's the emotion label, right? You have to be professional psychologists, that's impossible. So uh, we have different ways of collecting data and, and annotating data. Um, that uses video data, speech data, and written data. So um, uh, another aspect of empathet empathetic uh, conversational AI is actually understanding as the system converse with the user, converses with the user, it tries to understand the personality of the user. All right, so it will know whether you're extrovert, introvert by talking to you. So again, in this case, we propose a multimodal system where the system looks at the facial expressions uh, through video. Uh, it looks at the words the user is using by in the conversation, as well as the tone of voice and to detect um, user emotions. And here is the architecture where we have a full, um, at the end, we, we use a fully connect connected layer ReLU and a, uh, and a signal activation to the big five when we combine all three channels. Okay, so it's a one back propagation from the end. The difficulty of this is that, of course, we need to have multiple multimodal data. So the same video must show. Uh, so we use a video that has the voice track and also the uh, dialogue content. And uh, so that that kind of data also, um, they are abundant actually on, on the internet, but we need to collect them, right? And they need to be annotated. So, um, uh, in 2019 at ENLP, we published, we published this paper called Mo, Mixture of Empathetic Listeners. What's the idea here? The idea is that we actually have a meta listener. Okay. We have a meta listener to, uh, uh, output an emotion distribution. So we don't do like a binary yes or no for each emotion classifier before we're saying, okay, this is a happy classifier. This is a sad classifier and so on, but now. We have a share uh, listener and a meta listener, which will softly combine the output states of the appropriate listeners. So the listeners will share some uh, uh, share a uh, uh, states, and then they're tra they're trained together. So one listener is for one emotion, but they are uh, combined in a, a soft max way, so that the output. Uh, of the dialogue system, uh, the emotion recognition will be a soft combination. So it's not absolutely one emotion out of many as user emotions actually can be complex. So this works better, right? For example, here, uh, and then it will generate different, um, depending on the user emotion that's detected by Mo, the response generation will be different. For example, here, um, so my friend's baby fell down and scrapped his knee yesterday and I was trying so hard to cheer him up. So different listeners will actually give different answers. That was really nice of you, the caring one. I'm glad you were able to help him. Help him. The terrified listener will output, oh wow, that must have been so scary. The excited listener actually gave a very inappropriate answer. And uh, the proud listener would say something like, that was awesome, did he get any good at you? Well doesn't make a lot of sense, but a soft combination of all this hopefully will give me a better answer. The system will give a better answer. Here, the speaker says, my husband lost a job, but I'm hoping he can find a full-time job soon. So different kind of listener, again, will give different kind of answer. And then uh, Moa will choose uh, which one will be the better answer, okay? And uh, this is a visualization of emotion distribution. So, for example, from this context, I find it all, you cannot see it, but I'll read it to you. I find it all and annoying when people do not respond or even acknowledge emails, the response. That is so annoying. I hate when that happens. In fact, indeed, the maximize, maximum emotion it finds is annoying, annoyance here. Okay, here, another context. My husband lost a job, but I'm hoping he can find a full-time job soon. Uh, and then here, there is uh, the emotion output is uh, hopeful. So what kind of job is it? So the hopeful answer is what kind of job is it? Um, and so, so on. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, the uh, emotion distribution and the answer. 
from the uh, uh, emotion distribution. So the question now is that, uh, you know, as we, we said earlier, we want to uh, build an end-to-end -end neural empathetic chatbot or task-oriented dialogue system, either one way or the other. So what we did is actually we use uh, at the time GPT and then GPT-2, and today, of course, there's GPT-3, this large pre-trained language model in the transformer architecture. And then we just take the uh, uh, um, training data and the fine-tuned data. So there we use a little bit of data that has persona uh, characteristics and another little bit of data from Facebook that has uh, empathy characteristics. So they label emotion label in this data. And we use these data to fine tune the original transformer language model. Okay, so we add object, ob, uh, different objectives to, uh, to, the, to the system for fine tuning. Um, so for example, um, I will show you the system later, but actually, so what do we do is that the loss function will combine emotion recognition sentiment recognition and the reply. We want it to have a good reply and, uh, and, and a fluent reply. So the objective function combines all this and the emotion recognition and sentiment recognitions are pseudo tasks. Um, so the idea is that using these pseudo objectives, uh, combined objectives, pseudo task objectives, we can generate more empathetic responses. So what I would like to do now is show you a little bit how the system works. Can you see the system? Can you see? Hello? Hello? Uh, yeah. No, ma'am, there is nothing on the screen right now. Nothing on the screen. Okay, let me, uh, how yeah. do I share? Okay, share, share my screen. Oh, uh, share again. Um, yeah, it has come, it has come. Uh, now I want to. There is a slight learning after deployment. I know, but I want to share the the demo. How do I share? Um, uh, you can minimize this, and then if you want to uh, run some particular application. Yeah. So how do I share the application? Share yeah, you application. just minimize the PowerPoint, and uh, you let it run. We can see your desktop. Oh really? Okay. Let's yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see? Oh, no, yeah, it's, yeah, there. Yeah. it's there. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, so I won't take too much time. So, uh, uh, so this is it. Uh, so this is the example of the, uh, this is the uh, chatbot I talked about, the empathetic neural chatbot. So here the system asks, so we have no control of what the system is going to say. Uh, what it's going to do is uh, it's going to, you know, answer the question, answer. Not, it's not a question answering system either. It's just a chatbot. So let me show you. What do I mean by empathy? Okay, here is the sim says, hi, I'm Care, you're empathetic chatbot. How are you today? And then I'm going to say I'm worried about uh, my parents. So the system actually generate an emoji based on what I said. So this is a worry emoji and then it responds. Why? What happened? It also has a worry emoji. Uh, my parents are old. Uh, oh, oh, actually, I want to say this. There is a pandemic, and I am worried they will be infected. Okay. So, again, this is a more stronger worry emoji. Oh, no, I hope they are okay. That's a response of the system. And then this kind of uh, a stronger emoji. Can you see? Yeah, 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 please. Okay, so the system generates the emoji for me to show that I understand my emotion and it generates the answer and its own emoji, all right? Yeah, very old and I hope they will stay inside the house, their house. Okay, so this is my hope, and they gen the system generate this emoji somehow. It learns all this end to end. Uh, it's good that you're worried about them. That's it. Uh, I hope this virus will go away soon. Right, something like that. 
so I would like to see any new disease. <laughs> no, no, I hope not. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, what I mean by uh, empathy, right? It's the first chatbot in the world that actually generates emoji uh, showing that you understand, it, it understands your emotion and sentiment. And its answers tend to be more empathetic than uh, uh, other chatbots or other, and this is an end-to-end -end neural chatbot. So we are very happy with this result and we continue to improve it. Let me see. Your voice is not there. Uh, hello, you can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so also the system learns after deployment and there's a little red button for you to report any ethical issues. What do I mean by ethical issues? Because sometimes the system will give you um, inappropriate responses. It can be racist or sexist because it's learning from large amount of human to human conversational data. And, uh, and, and I'm sorry, no, no, no. It's learning from small amount of human to human conversational data, but it has this large pre-trained language model. And people know that, uh, I think it's commonly, common knowledge that these large pre-trained la language models, they contain human bias, right? So we allow users to give us feedback and even edit the answer of the system. Of course, we, the system does not just memorize your edit, but it will learn over time. And we think this is an important feedback loop. Uh, I will skip this. Oh, next, uh, we also have recently extended this chatbot to a multilingual personalized uh, system. It can now uh, converse with you in uh, actually seven different languages. It can also handle some of the mixed languages, so um, which is very convenient. Um, it's kind of fun. So you can basically converse with, uh, you can chat with the chatbot in different language and it will know which language to answer. All right. Um, it doesn't have uh, any of the Indian languages yet. So perhaps we can collaborate with some of the groups and then build that uh, language feature into uh, the system. Basically, these are the languages that my students and myself understand. So that's all we can do. And uh, this is a system that's uh, this is a system that's trained on all these languages together. It has a causal decoder that's trained on the uh, um, all language, all the database of all, of all these different languages together, and uh, they share a causal decoder. Uh, but you it. it it needs a language detector knows what to uh, which language to answer to All right um so here are, these are some of the examples i'm not going to show you on the on the live site but you can try it basically you can converse with the system in languages from one language to another sorry it will naturally um know what uh, which language it is can you hear me still yep just lost my one air pop, but doesn't matter. No. Okay. okay. So having said that, I would actually like to show you a bit. Do I have time still? Do I have time? Yeah, yes. Yeah. A bit yeah. more time. I want to show you yeah. some applications of empathetic systems. So what can these systems do for me other than, you know, there was a kind of fun chat bar with the emoji, right? Uh, turns out they can be very important. So here's a demonstration of a system, um, this is using modularized system. It's not end-to-end -end yet, but it's a helping uh, a student. So the system is uh, detecting stress and sentiment.
So this system will converse and then we'll look at the, you know, it detects the emotion and stress level. And at the end, uh, we'll give a di sort of a advice. Sorry. It's here. Okay, so this is an example of a uh, virtual therapist. We are currently working with hospitals in Hong Kong to uh, uh, develop this similar system for elderly patients uh, who might have uh, um, um, negative emotion, stress, and depression, and so on. And Hong Kong has a very large senior population. We have a million elderly, and uh, many elderly are very lonely. And uh, so developing this system uh, can potentially help our health workers to uh, uh, take care of these elderly people. And of course, we are also developing a system and uh, in the today's uh, environment of COVID-19 and confinement to help um, people in confinement. Right, I will actually skip this, um, this video about a smart speaker with empathy that we built for actually, I'll just show you a little bit. It's kind of oh no. Uh, Pascal, I think uh, there is no audio coming up. Ah, no audio. You don't you have, have to you cannot turn on the computer audio. No audio. You cannot. You cannot hear the audio. No, we cannot hear the audio. Okay, yeah. doesn't matter. Let Let me skip this then. Sure. Um. Yeah, um, let me go back. I knew something would be up. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, let me skip. This is a basically smart speaker with a, a task-oriented dialogue system inside, kind of like Alexa, but actually caters towards the mood and ambience. It focuses on recommending uh, music, okay? Um, and, uh, sorry, um, what's my... More used to Zoom. Uh, so, I, what happened? Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Okay. Now, uh, having talked about uh, co um, the applications of converse, uh, a pathetic conversational system, I would like to use the last part uh, of my time to talk a little bit about the ethical challenges. I mentioned earlier that I'm part of the partnership on AI to look at the ethical side of AI. And, uh, and, and then since we propose, since I proposed an empathetic system or empathetic machines in 2015, I've actually received a lot of emails from strangers around the world who've read our articles and our systems questioning whether we should indeed endow machines with emotional intelligence. Some people say, oh, uh, machines should remain machines. They should not be like humans. They should not have emotional intelligence. They should not pretend to be empathetic because then um, they're taking away what's human from us. 
others think it's a great idea because without emotional intelligence, machines can make mistakes, machines can, um, can, can hurt us. So there's a debate going on. So, and uh, there are some famous cases in the world uh, about uh, ethical challenges. So for example, this is a robot um, and it's actually considered a showbot, uh, Sophia. It, uh, it, can, it has like motors on the face that shows emotions. However, um, the emotions are generated by humans. So it's actually controlled by humans, but it gives uh, many people the illusion that machines today are so human-like, they're just like us. And this is a, a, a problem. Um, and, uh, but today we're trying to um, work with a um, Japanese uh, researcher in Kyoto to um, basically uh, use um, generated emotion. So use the, uh, the care, care chatbot you have seen uh, to use that as the brain of humanoids like this. And we shall see what results it would give. Um, but there is an ethical debate on how, how much we should give machines emotion. And it's an open question and, uh, and it's very important. And um, so this is something that a lot of people are concerned about and they're working on. Another issue is uh, maybe you've heard of Microsoft Pay, this um, chatbot that learned to be racist and sexist within 24 hours of going online. So that raised a lot of ethical um, concerns and they uh, took Tay offline immediately. So today uh, in conversational AI systems, uh, everybody working on that is uh, concerned about ethical issues. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these pre-trained language models contain a lot of human bias. So um, if you see the publications by GP from uh, OpenAI on GPT-3, they have a lot of tests and a lot of disclaimers about how sexist, how biased, how racist um, the system response can be. And uh, it's a new research area in conversational AI, as well as in AI in general, which is how to come up with a quantifiable ethical AI and uh, um, um, models. So it's a research area that I encourage people to get into as well. Oh, this is another example of ethical issues. So Google, uh, a couple of years ago, last year, demoed a duplex of a conversational system that sounds eerily human. So people cannot tell whether it's a machine or human. And this is one of the users that said, I'm genuinely bothered and disturbed how morally is the Google Assistant voice to act like a human and deceive other humans on the other line of a phone call. So uh, for 30 years uh, of my career, I worked on AI to try to make AI systems sound more human, respond more human, understand human better. But today there are these concerns that are coming out. So um, how should we uh, then uh, regulate uh, the development? First of all, how should we regulate the development of such system? How should we regulate the testing of such system and the deployment of such system? So uh, I'm part of the IEEE um, working group on uh, AI governance today, and we're going to spend the next two years working on these issues. So to end my presentation today, I would like to show you a movie clip, uh, and which raises the question of whether machines can be both empathetic and ethical. Uh, I hope you hear the sound here. Can you hear the sound? Can you hear uh, the sound? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Uh, you heard? Not yet. Oh. Can you hear the sound? No. No. You cannot no. hear the sound of this. No. Um. Uh, let me see. When you share the screen, there is yeah. a icon saying that, uh, do you want the computer audio or something like that? Mm, you share your screen. Um, here, right? Share I think my so. screen. Oh, share file from my computer, share application? No. Share web browser. Uh if you can share your file, then maybe it will play because it's an MP4 player. 
Yeah. I think it's a, yeah. So you share file. Oh, oh no, it's not. No, it's not. It's no? gone. No, it's uh, completely gone. Oops. No, share file is no good. But you could hear the first one. How come you cannot hear the second one? Interesting. Uh, sorry. Again, I'm not familiar with this. I'm going to do this again, screen. Uh, on video. Share. Share screen or share application? Share application? Uh, How to... Share application or share file? You can try any one of them. Share application, maybe. Okay, let's see this. Okay. Yeah. Let's share, see this. Can you hear the sound? Yes, yes. Oh, good. Device is not there. No, Sorry? no, it's not there. No, it's not there. I thought it was there, but it's not there. No problem. It's not? Okay. So, um, let me see. Use the. Um, if I use this, can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay. So, maybe this way. This is the crude way. So, you will hear from the screen directly. Let's see. Again, try again. If it doesn't work, then I'll just not do this, okay? Okay. Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Just bring me some cereal. That cereal is full of unhealthy ingredients. I threw it away. Don't throw away my stuff. Frank, that cereal hear? is for children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can hear now. That's yes. wonderful. Today, we're going to start a garden. Fuck this shit. Frank. You need a project. Mental stimulation plus a regimented schedule will vastly improve your cognitive functioning. Besides, it's good exercise. Frank, we're going to have to work together. You are a robot butler. I'm not a butler, Frank. I'm a healthcare aide, programmed to monitor and improve your physical and mental health. Yeah, get out of my house. If you're not going to cooperate with me, I might as well not be here. Fine with me. If that's the way you feel, I'll contact Hunter. Good. What are you doing? You got a phone up there in that brain? You're calling him? Look, you heard what he said. He was trying to put me into a nut house. I don't recall Hunter saying that. There's nothing wrong with my memory. I'm fine, I'm telling you. I'm fine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. My memory is fine. I'm doing. I'm talking to an appliance. I suggest you work with me. I'm not gardening. Can't you do that super fast? Some things take time, Frank. So, do we want to see this future uh, where robots can help humans by being empathetic, but also uh, having some kind of judgment and being ethical? So, that concludes my presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Punk. Uh, there are a few questions. I'll take up those. Uh, the first so, one is, yeah, uh, would you like to take it on your own or shall I read it out for you? Oh, please. I don't see it. Is it not okay, in the chat? Okay, fine. I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay. Uh, the first one is, can we use the same technology in medical field like epilepsy detection model? Oh, that would be very, very interesting. I would love to do that. I think that is the biggest application that this, um, so other than customer service, right? I think the medical application would be the most uh, useful um, domain we would like to explore. 
Uh, I do not, and I don't know, I don't have the domain knowledge about epilepsy. Um, I don't know, but apparently we can, uh, for example, detect the, um, you know, by conversing with a user to detect dementia and so on. Uh, you've all heard about this Montreal psychological assessment data that as tests that the President Trump boasted about. So it talks to you and asks you to remember some words and so on. So this system can, uh, this type of system can do that. Epilepsy, uh, I don't know. I would love to explore that possibility. Okay, I'll take up the next one. Uh, what would be the average life of these bots? Won't so much dependency on machines pose a problem for us in a long run? Oh, um, so these machines, of course, they, uh, they, the, the, the versions, or they keep learning and they keep having version updates. And uh, so when we talk about machines that I mostly work on, we, we work on software. Although recently we also put care into the body of a robot called Pepper, and we will work with robotic gestures. Um, I would say the hardware part is super difficult. It's hard actually to make robots to, to gesture, but that's not my area. Uh, but in the software side, on the software side, we, we focus on the algorithm. And uh, what, what was the last part of the question again? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, won't so much dependency on machines pose a problem for us in the long run? I see, I see. Dependency. Um, that's a very good question. I think it depends on how we use these machines, right? As I mentioned, my hope is that we can use empathetic machines in the medical area to help healthcare workers. When we work with hospitals, we actually ask the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers how they would like these machines to help them. And they always tell us that uh, there's just not enough people uh, to take care of all these elderly, uh, elderly patients. It would be good for machines to assist the medical workers. So, yeah, um, are we going to be so dependent on machines? Are we going to be chatting forever I mean, all the time with machines? There is a risk, but if it's built for a purpose for a task, uh, we should, you know, the medical workers will still have more control over the machine. Okay, I'll take up the next one. Uh, humans can be emotionally unstable. How can you avoid this case in artificial intelligence? Indeed. So, together with the issue of sexism, racism that humans have, and the artificial intelligence learns. Artificial intelligence, intelligence might learn from the emotional and st stable humans as well. That is a very good question. We have not begun to uh, explore uh, whether, whether the emotion we have shown or we recognize, the system recognizes stable or not. Um, that is um, a big area. We are really taking only starting at the on the journey to building empathetic machines. Okay. And how to handle emotional issues from humans? Um, we're only beginning to to study that. Okay, I'll take up the next one. How does the attribute extractor deal with misspelling, slangs, and poor grammar when learning in an open environment? Very good question. Again. Um, so these systems, since they're based on deep learning architecture, they don't actually look at the grammar, right, explicitly. So all these pre-trained language models seem to be able to handle ungrammatical uh, utterances as well, pretty well. We don't seem to have an issue with that. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's uh, learning, it, it's got billions of parameters and somehow it learns to uh, handle different kind, different style of input pretty well. So right now, that does not seem to be a concern. In previous versions, uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, in the uh, modularized systems, we were concerned about grammatical input because the language understanding part was built on uh, grammatically correct uh, training data. But today, it's no longer the no longer the case. The pre-trained language models are very very powerful. Okay. How does a text-based conversation system react to sarcasm? And oh. how is the system supposed to react to the same? Oh, that's a very, very good question. 
Uh, so I had a PhD student who finished his PhD last year or two years ago on um, humor recognition and generation using deep learning, again, end-to-end -end architecture. Turns out it could recognize sarcasm and humor pretty well um, by, uh, train, by training, just, just kind of uh, fine-tuning these models because deep learning models are so powerful. If we give it the uh, correct um, data, um, again, it, it learns humor and sarcasm pretty well. Um, it generates the response that's sarcastic, equally sarcastic, humorous pretty well. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it seems to work like a black box today. How does it? We don't actually know the features, right? So in the old days, when we were building all these systems module by module, we could actually um, check system output uh, or intermediate output to see what features it's looking at to, uh, to, to detect sarcasm. So is it looking at tone of voice, which feature of tone of voice? A higher pitch or lower pitch, we could actually detect that before. But those systems actually did not recognize sarcasm very well. Today's systems are super powerful. They they recognize everything super well, but we actually don't know what specific features they're learning because it's all hidden, all automatic feature learning, right? So there's a pros and cons. We don't know, but it works well. Um, yeah. So what okay, can I say? Okay. So the next one uh, is, does this artificial intelligence only respond according to empathy or with other happy, joyous, sad, etc. emotions too? So empathy is actually the ability to recognize all these emotions and respond appropriately. So it has both the emotional recognition capability and knowing how to respond uh, appropriately capability. That's the whole thing. It's called empathy. Okay. Uh, are there any chances of these robots being misused by a third party? There are always such chances. There are always such chances. Because today, all these code, uh, everybody's sharing everybody's code publicly, right? So our code is also public. You can take our code and build on top of it, whatever you want to build. Uh, so there are, of course, chances of these machines being used inappropriately. This is why we need to come up with uh, industry standards, uh, um, governance uh, standard, IEEE standards, and so on, ISO standards. But that also only governs the commercialization side of things. So if people are not commercializing the system and they use it in an inappropriate way, um, usually it's the community that will respond to it. So for example, in natural language processing community, the ACL community, people had responded very, very negatively, very strongly against um, AI facial recognition being used to uh, predict whether somebody's a criminal or not, right? So there was a lot of reaction to it and the original authors of such systems then um, uh, withdraw further research in this area or, or applications of that. So okay. ethical AI is a big issue and the community need to pay attention to it. Okay, so I'll take up the last three questions now. Uh, the first one is, uh, does the AI limits human imagination and creativity? And can this uh, AI system be useful for Alzheimer and cancer? Okay, so okay. let's, okay, so there are three different questions now. So one of the projects we are working on is uh, in collaboration with the Central Academy of Fine Art in Beijing. Uh, we have established AI art joint lab with them to use this kind of technology or natural language generation technology to make uh, movies. Now, uh, AI doesn't make movies on its own. It can generate scripts and generate video and all that, but the entire idea uh, is still, we still need a director, a human director. So. I would say AI today and tomorrow can become a tool for creativity, just like digital art before or digital music. AI is a tool for artists and uh, uh, and uh, and the writers to enhance their creativity. You'll be amazed how humans can be creative with new technology. That's my answer to the first question. And then the other question about Alzheimer's, we're actively working on uh, the Alzheimer detection early Alzheimer's detection using this technology. We're actively working on that with uh, our uh, life scientists in our university. 
uh, cancer, cancer. Um, so one application for using this conversational AI for cancer work is actually to take care of uh, cancer patients. A lot of cancer patients, after they, re they receive treatment, they can also become depressed. All right. So uh, the cancer doctors told me that they would like to have systems that can basically talk to these patients uh, from time to time and check on them, see how their mood is and how, um, how their mental health is. So conversational AI systems can help with mental health uh, in general. Now, there are other AI research that will help uh, cancer research and Alzheimer's research. My group is also working on um, uh, using DNA data from um, uh, Alzheimer's patients to come up with appropriate Alzheimer, early Alzheimer's detection and uh, uh, appropriate treatment plans. So this is in the area of machine learning for precision medicine. It's a huge area. We have a small effort, uh, a small group in that effort. Um, that's not related to conversational AI. It's just using machine machine learning uh, and big data to um, to look at um, uh, look at the, how to uh, cure or or treat cancer better. Um, there's another area of application of NLP, which is the uh, research on cancer and Alzheimer's. So recently, there's a huge amount of research on COVID-19, for example. There's like since January, there have been perhaps 70,000 papers published on this subject. So many doctors and medical workers cannot uh, catch up with the latest research. So we build a question answering system for them to ask questions and uh, go look into these uh, public publications and come up, find the appropriate answers from these papers for them. So that's another application of natural language processing called question answering and summarization. And that can help with scientific research on Alzheimer's, on cancer, on COVID-19, on, on many other um, areas. Okay, so that comes to the last question. How do you see artificial intelligence playing role in post-COVID time? So, yeah. So, first of all, I think there's a huge need for mental health care, right? We are all stuck at home. Uh, we have not traveled much. We are not seeing a lot of people. We are losing the human touch. So video conferencing allows us to stay in touch with our families and friends. Uh, but still, um, so there have been recently some conversational AI systems that came out from Stanford University, from our university, from my group, that uh, uses uh, conversational AI to um, take care of um, people who are stuck uh, in confinement at home. So that's one thing. So as we use online teaching, like online presentations, um, so conversational AI system or what we call virtual assistants or virtual therapists might come to play a bigger role in the future. And then um, of course we have, we hear a lot of rumors and a lot of scary news and a lot of fake news about COVID-19 and other things. And so it is important for artificial intelligence to help debunk these uh, this, uh, fake news, which is making everybody very nervous, very scared at home. So that's okay. uh, another big area. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fong. Uh, now I request uh, Professor Ajoy Khatak, uh, who's the chairperson of NASI Delhi chapter, to kindly say a few words before we close the session. Yeah. Uh, just one second. Thank you, Dr. Badot Saxena. Thank you, Professor Fung, for that wonderful lecture. Because uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, although I do not understand the intricate details, but it is a little scary as to how, in our old age, we are going to be controlled by these robots and who are more intelligent than human beings. But this is what is coming, and you have uh, shown us the future. And so we are indeed uh, extremely grateful for this wonderful talk. And I see that there are about more than 450 participants in today's workshop. So that shows the great interest that uh, students and teachers in India have taken in your talk and in the wonderful program that has been coordinated by Dr. Manoj Saxena, Dr. Kitika Jain, and Dr. Pooh story, mainly by Dr. Manoj Saxena. So for your information, this is a this is the concluding session of uh, 
of a summer school on advances in signal processing and machine learning, which started on 20th July, and it is getting concluded here with this wonderful talk. I must congratulate the organizers, particularly Dr. Manoj Saxena and, and uh, Dr. Tika Jain and Dr. Poonam Kastari for the tremendous efforts that they have put in, and it has worked out uh, beautifully. It is a flawless presentation, and I'm sure all the participants who are listening all are very fortunate to, to hear all the great speakers from throughout the world. In a sense, this COVID has allowed us to come together through these beautiful webinars and no spending money and, uh, and, uh, and we hear outstanding speakers. So it's a wonderful experience for me and I'm sure more so for people, for students who are working in the general area of signal processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So thank you, Manoj. Thank you, Professor Fung. And uh, for me, it has much, been a great and enjoyable experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I request uh, now Dr. Poonam Kasuri, uh, who is uh, the co-convener of this summer school. And she is the teacher in charge of the Department of Electronics of the India Lupadhyaya College to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ghatak and uh, Professor Fung for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, to put in my observation was that it was a wonderful experience all throughout these sessions. And as Professor Ghatak said that uh, this COVID has brought us, uh, given us a uh, nice opportunity to interact. And to this, I would just like to add one thing that uh, people who want to work, they will always find opportunities. And people who want to shirk from work, they will always find loopholes. So uh, by putting these words, I would just like to say a few words about the uh, concept of the program, uh, which has primarily two concepts. One is signal processing, and the other is machine learning or artificial intelligence. So signal processing was basically initially thought of as an analysis uh, field. But with uh, coming days, it has progressed to synthesis. So we are basically now synthesizing various uh, images, signals, images reconstruction, adapt using adaptive filtering, distributed sensing. And all this is helpful in your diagnostic and therapeutic medicines, radar imaging, sensor networking image compression, communication, and many more. And all throughout these sessions in the summer school, we went through all these aspects of signal processing. So signal processing is basically a combination with machine learning enables to solve many difficult inference problems. Further to put it, I would say that uh, whatever focus, is, focus was, was on the software aspect of it, but to generate a hardware solution which has a real-time application, it requires accelerators, FPGAs, and ASICs. And these uh, hardwares uh, shift the paradigm, uh, paradigm from uh, uh, high power-hungry CPUs and GPUs to low power consumption and high performance hardware components. So with this, I would say that uh, this summer school was beneficial from uh, two aspects. One, uh, it focused on so many areas. It uh, opens up the fields to uh, electronics people, students, as well as computer science students. Plus, if we see that most of the applications were related with the medical science or the biological field. So we can see that it amalgamates all so many fields together and uh, to bring in a real solution for a real problem. With this, I say once again, convey my thanks to everyone all the professors who presented to uh, Dr. Manoj, Professor Ghatak, uh, Dr. Gitika, and Dr. Amit Vandir also, and uh, all the participants as well. Thank you. Thanks. Over to Thanks, you, Manoj. Thanks, Pono. I request uh, Shweta Vodera, who is the secretary of this uh, program, to kindly say a few words.
Ja, schön da die Rolle. Ja. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to sing in a well said uh, talk, I must say. Uh, I think even if uh, we are scared of artificial intelligence, uh, it's been really very fascinating looking at the kind of work that you have presented. Uh, Fascinating to get that empathy driven chat box, which was generating emojis and messages, empathy driven. So, um, a wonderful way you have presented the entire artificial work that you have done. Uh, it was really thought provoking that, yes, uh, uh, this may encourage our students, our courses of computer science, they do have machine learning. They do have artificial intelligence as part of the course. So our students who are actually be a part of this talk were listening. Uh, they'll get encouraged to move towards this area. That's what I believe. And with this, I would like to thank the entire team of summer school. They really worked hard. I congratulate you all. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, for uh, uh, letting me being a part of this and listening to such high profile professors and people who are really uh, worked in various arenas and reached to their epitome. Uh, thank you so much and congratulations once again. Thanks. Thanks, Shweta. Now, uh, I request uh, Dr. Amit Pundi, uh, who is also one of the secretaries for the summer school, to kindly say a few words. Uh, thank you. And uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I am Amit Pundi, and I am uh, one of the organizers of this uh, summer school. Uh, I would like to begin with uh, thanking Professor Ghatak, Dr. Manoj, and Dr. Geetika, and other organizers for organizing this summer school and uh, giving me an opportunity to be a part of it. Uh, the oral experience of organizing this school was you know, amazing. Uh, there were uh, absolutely wonderful lectures, very insightful options in terms of uh, you know, fundamentals and uh, practical implementations. Uh, this was the you know kind of course that is needed uh, for machine learning basics for learners uh, to apply machine learning in their uh, respective areas of research. It was a you know a great opportunity provided by uh, the organizers. Uh, I think this uh, this summer school accomplished what it claimed to do. Uh, it served a wonderful and broad introduction to machine learning. Uh, hundreds of uh, participants attended all the session, uh, and I congratulate uh, everyone who participated. It has been a sincere joy to be together this summer, and uh, hoping that uh, next year also we'll be together. I thank all uh, the uh, complete organizing team uh, for, for giving me this opportunity. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, now I'd like to ask Kitika uh, to kindly formally thank Professor Fong and to present the word of thanks. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, no duty is up more urgent than that of returning thanks. And uh, it's my pleasant duty today to present a vote of thanks at the culmination of the summer school on advances in signal processing and machine learning. Uh, I express my deepest gratitude to Professor Pascal for agreeing to deliver a talk on our valedictory session in such a short notice. On behalf of the entire organizing committee, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Ajay Ghatak, Chairperson Delhi in Chapter Nasi, uh, Professor Mridula Gupta, Head of the Department of Electronics, University of Delhi, and Dr. Hem Chand, Principal, Dean Dayal Upadhyay College, for providing us the platform and uh, immense support for the organization of this event. I must express my deep sense of appreciation for all our speakers who spared their valuable time to be with us from all over the country and across the globe. My sincere thanks to them for providing excellent coverage of the topics and exposing the participants to the latest and uh, novel developments in the area. Members of the organizing committee, Dr. Poonam Kasturi, 
Dr. Shweta Vadera and uh, Dr. Amit Mundir deserve special thanks for all the effort put into this uh, mega event. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants who were there with us patiently in all the sessions on varied times of the day, be it morning 10 o'clock, afternoon 2 o'clock, evening 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. I can't thank them enough for participating overwhelmingly and making the event a great success. I hope these six days would have been fruitful and uh, enriching for you. Uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you so very much. Thanks, Manoj. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Professor Gadak. Thanks a lot, Professor Fong. And uh, it has been a journey which I never actually expected uh, that uh, seven days I initially planned for five, then went to six, then to seven. And in all throughout all these sessions, I've seen the, the attendees have been 400 plus all throughout. So that shows the, uh, the ability of the speakers to hold back all the attendees and to maintain the sessions and to timely complete the program within the stipulated time itself. Thank you very much. And hope to see you all next year, maybe in person, face to face. Sign.